Welcome to the Contractor Success Forum. Today we are discussing how to find the right joint venture partner. Here on the Contractor Success Forum, we discuss how to run a more profitable, successful construction business and finding and even knowing that joint venture partnerships are even a thing when you're bidding these jobs. I don't think I realized that was a thing. So we have with us Wade Carpenter, Carpenter and Company CPAs and Stephen Brown, McDaniel Whitley, Bonding and Insurance Agency. And I'm Rob Williams, Iron Gate Entrepreneurial Support Systems and the Pumpkin Plan for Contractors book. So, all right, guys, I, this is just something that I wish I knew a lot more, known a lot more about this the joint ventures for a job. We had partnerships and stuff, but I didn't consider that as much. This is just a huge opportunity. And Stephen, you were talking about the opportunities for us and why this is so important. All right, there's more work coming out than ever right now, and it needs to be completed. There's some good profits to be made, and they may be too much for you, and you want to partner up with someone. Joint ventures are all about partnering up with someone. And I guess it's so timely that we have this topic, Wade, because it just doesn't happen overnight. I read somewhere that on a minimum, it takes 18 months worth of, they call it capture cost. Capture cost is what it costs to build and develop that relationship with the potential joint venture partner. So you should get started now. So what's the first thing, Wade? Well, before we kind of launch into that, I was also going to echo what you were saying. We've done a couple of podcasts on the joint ventures. I think they've probably been one of the more listened to podcasts we've done. But Stephen did a good episode on the federal contracting and the mentor-mentee situation. And there are a lot of these coming out. But I've worked with a lot of joint ventures, and we kind of like working with them. But not all of them turn out the way we want them to. And not always are the partners compatible. So that's why we wanted to talk about it. Because as Stephen was saying, you probably shouldn't, just because you know somebody, just go jump in, jump in bed. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, no. You know. You go listen to another podcast to hear more about more of the pros and cons of starting a joint venture. But in this episode, we're talking about how to find the right joint venture partner, right? Yeah. I know I've had partners in some businesses and they were great when you do it, but you just get down to, I guess this is your first point in the compatibility and it? it's like the, yeah. you get down to the point where I had a partner one time that if he wasn't fighting, he didn't feel like he was working with his own partner, not against somebody else. If he didn't, <laughs> he just enjoyed fighting and the friendliest guy in the world. He was the friendliest guy, but business meant fighting about every detail to him. Right. And then it's, wait, we're supposed to be on the same team over here. Hold on. So. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, what we've got today, what I was wanting to go over my top 10 factors when selecting a joint venture partner. And as Rob said, compatibility. It's one thing if you met somebody at a trade association or whatever, you know them a few years, but how somebody is socially is not necessarily how well they work together. And as Rob said, personalities can be conflicts. But the best one is someone you respect. That makes you compatible. They have certain things that they do better than you, or they may be a specialist in something on a project that you don't know anything about. But a lot of the best joint ventures when you're first getting started to me and being compatible is consider talking to a your best friendly competitor about going together. Someone may have more equipment or more technical experience, or it may just be a big job with a lot of manpower. And together, the two of you can get it knocked out quickly and make a better profit. That's the reason you would go after that, right? Well, again, there are several reasons you can go after a project. Sometimes you have differing expertise that you said. A lot of times this mentor-mentee thing, that's a way for a lot of smaller contractors to get a leg up and move to the next level. But number one, you know, the compatibility is if you can't work together, it's not going to work long term. Right. And if you're the smaller entity putting together a government joint venture, and you want to attract and talk to a larger company about doing joint ventures, the better you can show them that you have all your systems and processes in place and what you would bring to the partnership is a key selling point. 
Yeah. And we'll talk about some of those things as we go down the list too. But the next one I really want to talk about was financial stability. I've seen, as I think Stephen was saying, there's typically a dominant partner and then maybe somebody trying to get a leg up. But I've seen situations where a smaller contractor may not be that stable and they're depending on this job to live. And they try to suck all the cash out and it jeopardizes the ability to get the job done. You ever see that? Sure. Yeah. I've actually seen the opposite where the big guy, you assume that they're stable because they're really big. I've actually, I can think of two wins immediately. And then the big company took all the cash out and left this other guy that was just dependent on the other guy. He just thought size, since they're so big, I'm not going to ask all these questions. I remember one that had a problem with one company and then they were the majority of it. And then they took all the money out of the other company. And I ended up hiring the other guy, the guy that was the small guy later, but he ended up coming to work for me because he was a partner in it. And then they siphoned all the money out of here. They had control and then put it all in the other company with the losses and never occurred to him that they could do that. And then he was signing everything. So he was left with all the liability on that. And he was like, he was only like 10%. And oh, he was just, he was done. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've seen some horror stories too, where one of the partners has the ability to go, you know, usually you're getting a loan or whatever based on your own credit or whatever, but I've seen some contractors be in bad straits and they go and tie in the joint venture. And so the other partners on the hook for a loan that they may have taken all the money out themselves. Uh -huh. And so again, financial stability, I guess we could spend a lot of time talking about that one. But, but you may wonder why a bonding company might like a joint venture. And they do. That's just it. It can help you get a larger bonded project by putting a joint venture together. And also, there's so many different documents, Wade, about, you know, well, we'll talk about legal and contractual considerations later. But there's so many documents to put together a joint venture properly to protect yourself. Yeah. The third one we already kind of alluded to as well, the expertise and experience. Um, sometimes there are specialized jobs or I know I had one where they had people doing work with like moving the direction of rivers and streams and stuff like that. And apparently you have to have some specialized knowledge on certain things like that, or maybe it's a trade and maybe that's why you're getting together, but you know, you gotta be able to know that these people can do what they say they're going to do, especially when it's something you know nothing about. Yeah. Right. If it's a job where the joint venture partners, one of them is one trade and the other one is another trade completely, but those two trades make up the entire part of the project, it might make sense. I, I do see this, that people thinking they have these skills and I've heard, seen so many people so excited about it because they think that's the only thing that matters. Oh, this is the perfect company. We're going to take over the world because we have this and we have that and we're going to do this together. And it's just going to be amazing. And it is across different industries, not just contracting, but you see that. And that's just one of the many factors and people don't get past thinking about this one. So this is the, the having those expertise and the skills that go together to form this amazing partnership. It's just I see that over and over again and they can explode because they never even consider all the other things. They just think the product that they can produce is just so amazing. The, the service or what they can do with it or the synergy of the, this guy that nobody can compete with them. If those two guys come together. Right. Well, I guess moving on to the next one, the reputation and you wouldn't think reputation would really be that big of a deal. Sometimes just in it for one project and in and done, but I actually had a situation several years ago where a very large general contractor that is well known throughout the Southeast and I will not ring up, they had a horrible reputation of screwing over subs and believe it or not, my client was a very large general contractor as well. They subbed out a wastewater treatment plant. but simply because this larger contractor had such a bad reputation. A lot of the subs that very much valued working with my client, the general contractor, would not work on it because they were afraid they wouldn't get paid uh -huh. down the line. So 
the reputation, I would say that's not really a big deal, but in this case it was. I had something similar last year. I was talking to somebody and they were going to actually acquire, I guess you can say the partnership. And then the other guy knew this, I knew the questionable owner and apparently I didn't realize he was into a lot of nefarious activities. <laughs> yeah. So like, Oh no, we're not doing anything. If that guy's involved, we're not touching it. And I, I'm a really nice guy. So I was surprised about it. So that reputation can be, yeah, you're, you're afraid you're going to go to jail. Sometimes it's not just the subs. Some people might be involved in some crazy things. The Memphis mafia down there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Hey, that's you said too much. Elvis we can't say anymore. Getting old. They're not as scary as they used to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like a thing up there in Memphis. <laughs> it is. In Atlanta. <laughs> the next one on the list is communication and collaboration. You know, especially when you're working with somebody that you got two very different pieces of the puzzle and you got to get it put together. You got to be able to work with these people. And I've seen situations where somebody is very detail oriented, say, on their job costing, and the other ones fly by the seat of their pants. You ever see that? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, the better you know them, that helps a lot. I had a partner like that one time. He actually had really high margins. He had some patents and stuff. So he had some really high margins, but I was amazed, really successful making a lot of money. He didn't keep job costs at all. There was no job cost. And I was just like, whoa, he didn't really, he had some like general lines and stuff and he wasn't, it wasn't a bonding situation, but I was just shocked. And so our first company that we did together, we had $9 an hour people keeping the books and stuff. It was a mess. It was a real big mess, but books didn't matter. It was just the bank balance to him. So he didn't really look at his financials. And I was shocked because he was such a detailed person. He was engineering and software all this on the construction side it was so detailed but not the financial side well let me throw this out if you have a joint venture each party's gonna designate someone to be the managing venture that's usually the owner of the company managing venture so if anybody in your party on that project isn't getting along or if you're not getting along with your other joint venture partner get it resolved collaboration and communication yeah. talk about it we say that don't we guys there's nothing more important than realizing that contractors as a general rule love talking about their feelings and what's going on and uh, <laughs> in a peaceful setting yeah. in a comfortable loving warm environment right I don't know if our listeners Hi. can pick up the sarcasm there. <laughs> He's going to pull out a singing kumbaya and stuff. Hey, look, you know, it doesn't have to be that. But, you know, seriously, you got to be a collaborative person to even put a joint venture together. So this is a great point, Wade. Yeah, because I had one that had some of my people working for him. And this guy is actually the, the nice guy that loved to fight. But got down to when somebody was ready to pill, he said, oh, no, they didn't do a good job on that. We're not paying them. It's like, you don't just not pay them because you don't like it. It's been going on. So it was a tough situation. He's like, I'm not paying them for the work that they've been doing. So it was. Ugly. Well, guys, I can tell you that the best contractors out there, and this is a fact, the best contractors out there uh, know and respect their competition. When they're slugging it out over a job, it can be a bloodbath, but once that's over, they're back to being friendly competitors. Right. Anyway. So got to be collaborative and communicate. Well, the next one on the list, I think Stephen already brought up the legal and contract obligations. Yeah, sorry like that. about that. I got excited. That's okay. If you want to go ahead and talk <laughs> about it, it's a big part of this and having a partner you can trust and having a joint venture agreement between the two you can trust. There is going to be a construction attorney in your area, folks, that knows joint ventures. Your CPA can help. Your attorney can help. But I can tell you, I have a book called Joint Ventures in Construction that has a form for just about every type of scenario. So I can tell you that when I joined up with McDaniel Whitley, they were my best friends, and we decided we were not going to let our friendship be lost by being in business together. So we spent six months going over the legal documents. And yes, it's happened where we had to 
bring that document up and remind someone of what we agreed to. We've been together for, for 13 years now. So anyway, the legal documents that protect the joint venture, you want the job to be able to cash flow itself, but the joint venture may need things at certain times. They might need certain resources. And that's all spelled out in the joint venture agreement. Yeah. I've had so many people say, Hey, I've got an agreement. I w went to, what is it? Legal zoom or <laughs> what's it called? Legal document. And they downloaded a contract and right. then they, that's what they've got in it. And that was really tough. But well, I understand that lawyers cost money. I remember dad used to say, look, you get these contracts at least so it's communicated also just so the person it's not that even if you're not going to sue them like he and his partner they were never going to sue each other and they never sued anybody else but they still needed a good contract even if it was just go back to communicate it and when we did have the lawyers drawn up it was really important to to put all your bullet points down first and then give it to the lawyer because the lawyer is going to do what he thinks you want and you think the lawyer can read your mind because everybody thinks we're all alike and that might not be your situation. So you got to spend some time in there. It's tough when you're in a small job. That's where it really gets kind of ugly because there's not enough money in the project and the overhead to spend a lot of money on an attorney or something. So anyway. Well, way to go, Mr. Williams. What great advice. Yeah. He was awesome, Rob. Yeah. You were blessed you. to have him. Nobody wants to uh, get involved with a lawsuit. You're right. And again, it goes back to communication, which is above, I noticed, Wade, you have it listed above the legal section. Yeah. Well, yeah. I also noticed you're leading straight into the next one because you just said the word resources. Uh, the next one on the list is resources and capabilities. And sometimes it's, you got specialized equipment. Sometimes you got specialized people on your team that has the knowledge. That's partly why you're getting into bed with these people to knock out a project. So um, yeah, that, that's a huge thing because there are a lot of skilled people that don't have the financial ability. They don't have the cash or something. They could really do these jobs. And so you can look both directions. If you've got some cash, you can find some of those guys to do a joint venture and you don't have to partner with them. A joint venture to us, a lot of time was not a formal document. We just said, we're going to do a joint venture. That means we're going to kind of do something together. And I don't think we realize that you can formally set up a joint venture without having a whole company. But even yeah. They're just so. splitting profits agreements and stuff like that. So. Right. As you said a couple of times, Wade, you want to get in bed together, but that doesn't mean you're involved in a romantic relationship. You're just <laughs> in the same Bed. We're not going to go yeah. there. So. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Bed, maybe, maybe that's what we should have, should have called this, the one project stand. Okay. Well, on that note, that, that, that demeans a good joint venture, Rob. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> hear that kind of talk. All right. Go ahead, Wade. I will keep moving here because not sure where we're going. Cultural <laughs> fit. We already talked about compatibility, but some people have this laid back attitude that Rob was talking about and others like, Hey, let's get it done. Let's have the cost down to the T and sometimes people show up whenever they want to show up and other ones are like, Hey, we got to have a detailed schedule. So cultural fit, cultural fit. Yep. 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 Like that. Through your internal controls to your in-house personnel fit. Well, I think that cultural fit really goes back to the whole, have you defined your value system and what's more important in a lot of things, it's probably too deep to talk about too much in here. But that's where I know in our, the mergers and acquisition company that I deal with, they were saying it, it was an unbelievable number of, I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it was like more than 50% of the deals didn't work out because the value system, they tried to mold the two people together. People think a good person means something. They're good people. Oh, they're good people. Well, their definition of good may be a different thing to raise the decisions that you do without getting into that, but make sure you've got those values down, look into a value system on that cultural fit, because that's what kills most of these companies on that. It's not a lot of these other things. I remember this, I don't know if this is a value or not, but I remember saying, would you rather know, we had a conversation with a 
really cost conscious partner of mine that didn't want to spend the money on anything. Is that same one, the $9 an hour bookkeeper. But I said, would you rather know your costs and be able to price it correctly? Or would you rather have the cheapest cost? And for me, it was like, I'd rather know my costs because I'm interested in the difference between my cost and the sales price. I don't want to just be guessing it's shotgun, but his product was different. So it wasn't that he was wrong. His product sales, he asked for the most that he could get, and he had a huge margin. So his product led him to believe, just keep it low. He wasn't ever going to have a loss because he had a huge profit margin, like 80% profit margins because he had a patent. So he wasn't that concerned about it. But anyway, so cultural fit, but that, that also gets into your day-to-day -day thing. Do you like to fight? Is that part of your culture? Do you like to get along? So make sure that goes on down and when you're not just for you and the owner, but you're two companies that may be working together. Right. Well, here you go, Rob. Now you're leading into the next one. We're talking about decision-making and governance. The exact same kind of thing. You got to understand with a joint venture, somebody's got to make decisions. If it's a 50, 50 split or something like that, and you don't spell this out, who's going to be making the final decisions on things. We really got to know that. And somebody that's used to making that, authoritative type decision making, but they're the minority partner. Well, you need to talk about these things up front before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's spelled out in your joint venture agreement too, Wade. And again, not only are there owners, but sometimes there's a committee put together okay. within the joint venture of just working out. I would say arbitrating, that sounds too drastic, but just working through problems. Well, I think making the decisions, what I've seen is people have had their one situation in a company. So they think that's the rules for every company and every agreement. They don't realize they're different things. I think the typical situation is decisions are made on how much money somebody puts it in. Let's just say that's the simplest form. You know, somebody put in 51% of the money, but you may have an ownership agreement and percents, but that may not be how the decisions are made. You could have a contract where the decisions are not based on equity ownership. And people don't realize that's even a possibility. It's defining the way those ownerships. Somebody can have, I know like when you're setting up things for estates and tax things and trusts, sometimes the owner may not want to have much of the equity in there because he may want it to go to some kids or something like that, but they'll have total control of the governance, even though right. it's not their money in there. So uh, he who has the gold does not always make the decisions. I think, well, what's that thing? He who has the gold makes the rules. Not always. If your government's document, a, if your document, the golden rule, he who has the gold rules. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, last one here is the project management and a joint venture. A lot of times you got to remember, this is not two separate companies. This is two or more partners coming together to get a job done and you got to look and see how we are putting the projects together. So a lot of times you're putting a schedule of values together, your pay apps together because you got different pieces of it. So as we said, with the management style, people manage projects very differently. Any thoughts on that? I think it goes back to the cultural fit there. Yep. It's a huge thing. I don't think people do realize that projects are managed differently. Just like I was saying with some people, it's all about the document and then you put all the responsibility, say commercial, there's a whole lot more responsibility on the subcontractors. There's usually more contract in there where the residential of those guys, if the subcontractor makes a mistake, the builder tends to take more of that responsibility and fix it. Those kind of things have control over it and they'll manage the details of showing that heat and air guy how to put it and where to put it. When you get in the commercial stuff, you know, it's like, Hey, this is yours. There's specs. You go out there, you do that. So they're two different things. Some contractors really control the whole quality day to day of the job. I was framing for a contractor one time that wouldn't buy blueprints. I don't know how the heck, and we were doing paddles and trust we drew, but he was building the houses off of a brochure that he got out of somebody else's model home and he had whited out the name of the other company and written his name of his company on there. And he actually built the house out of that little piece of paper. Is the house still standing? I'm just there are a ton curious. of them. It's a whole community. These are hundreds of houses. It was a big project. I'm not saying they were bad houses because 
their management, they had to be on every one of those houses, every little detail because there were no job specs. I mean, it was just the old fashioned, you're practically out there building the houses with your hands, as opposed to the extreme, I'll go back like the university housing that I was doing those dormitories. It was just extremely, they were not going to mess with you because you were liable for everything as the subcontractor. And it was just about that piece of paper. But anyway, that was a big project management. Project management issues. Yes. Yeah. Well, again, I see project managers, even in the same company, estimators in the same company, they a lot of times do things different between project managers and estimators and, and making sure they're compatible between two different companies is another level. But I think we hit our Top 10, believe it or not, I've got 20 more factors that maybe you should consider when you're thinking about getting your joint venture partners to put in a checklist, because this is a big deal. I keep using the term getting in bed with somebody, but you are, even if it's just for one project, but maybe you're looking for a longer term relationship and that can be a big stepping stone for some people. You could also get on the website, contractormatch.com. That's good. And then there's joint venture Yentas that put the right people together. No, I'm making that up. That doesn't exist. <laughs> you got to do it on your own, guys. Look at this checklist. Give these things some consideration because they're all hugely important yeah. to your joint venture. Yeah. And so don't forget, it's so exciting when you talk about these joint ventures and coming together. People get so excited about how they can do the job. So don't forget about all this part because it could be a huge opportunity, but it could be also a huge hole that you're stepping into if you get into the wrong thing, no matter how good the physical job situation is that you're doing or whatever you're providing. If you don't have these other things, it can be a perfect job, but it's not going to work. You're going to, yeah. it's going to be a mess. Guys, another fact that I read last week, fact, because I read it on the internet, you yeah. know, it's true. 37% of all the construction work for the army of new work was issued to joint ventures. So wow, there we go. Well, to wrap this up, I think, uh, like I said, I wanted to offer that checklist of 30 items you may want to consider in finding a joint venture partner. As well as uh, we created another one is 50 items that you may want to consider in forming your joint venture agreement. So they can go to our website at carpentercpas.com and the, the joint venture page and get that for free if they're interested. Fantastic. Right. Go to our page and there'll be a way to get to it. You go to contractorsuccessforum.com or go to, what is it again, your website? Carpentercpas.com. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for coming to the Contractor Success Forum today. Tune in to YouTube and subscribe for us. Go ahead and hit the subscribe. That helps more people see that. I know you probably want to keep this valuable information just for yourself. But be just generous. It. Be Save it. And let everybody share the wealth here. So have that and then download the podcasts. Fun. And we will be back with you for the next episode of the Contractor Success Forum. It's all about collaboration. There you go.